Let's start with the story. There was once a town at a day's remove from the big city, and in this town was a barber shop. The barber who owned the shop was of good importance to the townsfolk, for without the barber, nobody felt quite in step with fashion, particularly when a pixie cut or mutton chops had just become the season's big thing. Now the barber's job was to give people the season's look, and for this, the barber was paid well. But the townsfolk, who cared very much for fashion, but were just as anxious to be thought vain by one another, also sought the barber out for another reason. The barber was charming and kind, and cared about clients' problems and their haircuts equally. When you were with the barber, vanity was miles away, and you were a person who mattered because only you were you. Off in the big city, fashions changed each and every day. Some of them made their way to the town, but not nearly all. There, the city folk had less time for barber shops, and their barbers had less time for caring. For now, let's hold the story there. When I began researching friendship as a sociological institution, this story was my research hypothesis. Instead of the town, it's citizens from the city, and then the city, we live in the micro, meso, and macro levels. And the barber and the barber shop represent our friends and the institution of friendship, whose manifest function is to help us find belonging, and whose latent function is to allow us to be the particular individual each of us happens to be. But to find belonging in being different, instead of the anxiety Emile Durkheim, one of the first sociologists, called anomie. But how can we study a social concept of friendship when one per person's friend may vary very widely from another person who somebody else calls their friend. To do so, we'd have to agree that even though the friends in particular vary, there are many aspects of a friend all of us are socialized to accept. To study friendship a bit, I turned to a work in symbolic interactionism, also known as the Chicago School. For this sociological approach beginning in the early 20th century, quote, social reality is made up of constructed symbols and meanings that are exchanged with others through daily interaction. And also, quote, the constructed self, however changing, functions as a guide to social behavior. My major source was the book Friendship as a Social Institution. It focused more on the first assertion how friendship's everyday meaning works more than the second, because at that time, during the 1970s, there was a lack of scholarship to even define what friendship was. Remember the story we began with? It turns out that research supports the manifest and the latent functions of friendship's institution I proposed. On the manifest function of friendship, Gerard de Settles writes of, quote, some broad and flexible covenant that joins people to one another and regulates their interpersonal relations. He posits this in the modern absence of macro-level kinship structures and labor stratification systems that would work like a caste system. Friendship settles defines as a voluntaristic personal relation where each party values the other as what he calls a person qua person, or a person in their own right. I suggest his theory on how that recognition value is achieved constitutes friendship's latent function. According to Settles, quote, tests must contrast the person's behavior against what seems expedient, conventional, or merely routine. And he's, he calls these tests of, quote, real selfhood, remissions from public propriety. Now, when I imagined my story of friendship, I assumed that friendship latently acts to fulfill a desire to be recognized as an individual in one's own right, which is supported by the research. But the manifest function of fashion only holds to a certain point with friendships. Belonging to a society beyond oneself holds for both. But I also assumed that friendships practice, like modes of fashion, was a product of the macro level. I did this because, in my story, 
a pattern of industry in the big city makes its way to the town and ends the barbershop's business. The invention of handheld mirrors empowers the townsfolk to confront vanity on their own terms, which is then preferred to doing so with the barber, and then they render their own haircuts. So why doesn't the story end this way? I ventured that online social networking technology was functionally putting friendship out of business. Maybe your personal experience contradicts this, but as it turns out, so did my research. If we use symbolic interactionism to understand friendship, one of the central arguments that motivates this way of doing sociology, to use Professor Mike Danza's phrase, is that, quote, this perspective sees people as being active in shaping the social world rather than simply being acted upon. So, if possible, what actions or behaviors would people, the social actors, have to institutionalize over time to make the symbolic interactions of friendship lose their meaning? There are many potential answers to this question. Let's look at just one and see what recent research says about online friendships' actual symbolic interactions. Do friends online regard each other's equals as in-person friends would? According to a study done in 2007, comparing Israeli teens' similarity to their friends and how strong they judged that bond to be, friends made online may be less likely to be of the same age income status, or gender than the friends they made at school. But the online friends were closest when they shared city of residence and gender. As the study's authors note, the working assumption of friendship in the research has been that individuals who, are, who share similar social backgrounds, that is, homophilous persons, are more likely to be friends than those from heterogeneous backgrounds. However, the authors also note that the studies that have been conducted in schools in the past are already observing friendships between locals of similar ages. Alone, this study suggests that friendship online is more likely to make equals of persons of different social statuses than is friendship in person. But the argument in the 1970s among American researchers proved true here. Homophilia makes strong friendships more likely. In this regard, from this perspective, online friendship is starting to look less like a competing institution than an expansion of the friendship we started with. As you may have guessed, this is just the tip of the iceberg. The sociology of friendship is a big topic. Friendship has been an object of study since at least 400 BCE, and modern sociology is still developing more theories in symbolic interactionism and other schools beyond. We could ask whether the institution of friendships always stayed the same, or we could compare friendships institution from how it is in one culture to how it is in another. And those are just two examples. So. As you brave this study in sociology and others, I hope I've illustrated that you can start by finding inspiration right where you start today. Thank you for watching. This has been Giovanni Garcia, just another client at the Barbers and CMC class of 2021.